Good morning. Welcome to Dalry to Baptist Church. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Welcome to Dalry to Baptist Church. We are so glad that you're here visiting us, uh, gathering in person. And to all you who are watching live, we are so grateful that you are tuning in to watch this service. Um, as you just saw, today is Graduate Sunday. We are honoring and recognizing four of our high school seniors, uh, four active high school seniors who have been very diligent and faithful to be here Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, and at all the different events that we do. We're going to be starting to recognize our gra first graduate, Charles Thomas Blunt. Charles is graduating from Ezekiel Academy. He is going to be attending Pensacola Christian College, where he will be studying secondary education to become a teacher. Some of his special interests are writing. He loves to write. Now, I know I love Charlie so much. He has been one of those that me and him get along. We're both geeks, so we talk about superheroes and Star Wars and all these different things. I love him very much. We have a, have a very good friendship, and I'm going to miss him a lot. He is, these four are very special to me because I've, this is, I've been here two years, and uh, this is a first big group that's leaving my youth group, and I'm going to miss them all very much, and Charlie is one of those I'm really going to miss. So, Charles Thomas Blunt. Next up, we have Dawson McKinley Callens. Dawson is, going, is graduating high school from Everest Academy. He's going to be attending Auburn University, where he will be studying marine biology. He received the Presidential Scholarship at Auburn. During his time in high school, he spent a lot of his time in the Montgomery YMCA swim team as a swimmer. Some of his achievements, he was a part of the Beta Club and the National Honors Society. I love Dawson so much. He is one of those that's just fun. When he shows up on Wednesday nights, he is always talking to all the, all the youth, old all the way to the young, and he never tries to act cooler than anybody else. He just loves to be fun and hang out with everybody. I'm also going to miss him very, very much. So Dawson McKinley Callens. <laughs> now we have William Caleb Gilliland. William is graduating high school from Churchill Academy. He will be spending his first two years at Trenum State, where then he will transfer to AUM to study environmental biology. Will is also another one of the special guys. I just love hanging out with him Wednesday nights. We have a lot of good talks. He loves fishing. He loves hunting. He loves all those type of stuff. And maybe I'm not the most interested in that, but I love hearing his heart about it. And I'm so excited to see what the Lord does with him in the future as he pursues this degree. William Caleb Gilliland. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Riley Elizabeth Rayburn. Riley is graduating high school from Evangel Family Christian Academy. She is going to be attending college at the University of South Alabama, where she will be studying radiology. She received the ACT scholarship, and she was a part of the Beta Club during high school. Riley is another one of those I just love so dearly. She's a leader in our youth group. The younger girls look up to her a, a, a lot. They really do. She talks with everybody from seventh grade and all the rising seventh graders every single year. So she's going to be very, very missed in our group. And I want to mention this about all four. All four of these are actually a part of our student youth leadership team as well. So we've been spending time trying, I've been trying to pour into them leadership skills, and I've seen them each individually grow tremendously. I know the Lord is going to use each of them to do amazing things wherever they go to college. We are sending them out as missionaries to their colleges, and they're going to be a light of hope at those places. Riley Elizabeth Rayburn. It is a very sad thing. I'm happy for them, but I'm also so sad that they're leaving. This is so sad. But I love each of you so much. I'm so proud of each of you. I've seen each of you grow tremendously these past two years I've been here. And I built a relationship with each of you individually. And I'm going to miss you. You guys need to come back and hang out with us. Um, I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to get started with the rest of our service today. Father, we thank you so much. And we love you so much for all that you've done for us. I thank you so much for these four students who you brought into my life and allowed me and given me the opportunity and privilege to pour into them. You are so good to them. You have, I have seen tremendous growth. You have grown them in a, a tremendous way, God. And I know that you're going to continue to be faithful to them as they go off to college. 
you are going to continue to grow them, and you're going to use them to glorify your name and make your gospel known to the ends of the earth. You, I'm so grateful for this Sunday morning where we get to gather together as a people to worship you. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be focused on your praise, that they would be inclined to your heart, and that we would focus on giving you worship that is worthy of how great you are, God, as we sing and as we hear from God's word this morning. God, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for coming down and dying for us. Thank you for taking my sin and for, giving, uh, and for allowing all those who repent and believe to come to saving faith in you. And we are a people in this room who have been saved by Christ. And this morning, we give you all the praise and all the worship. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, good morning, church family. Stand with me as we worship this morning together in praise. Sing it out. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come. Just as you are before your God, come. Sing it again. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God, and one day the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before your Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Oh, one day every tongue will confess you are God, and one day every knee will bow. And still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before your
God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. God will make a way there seems to be no way he works in ways we cannot see but he will make a way for me he will be my guide hold me closely to his side with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way by a roadway in the wilderness he'll lead me and rivers in the desert I will see oh heaven and earth will fade but his word will still remain and he will do something new today God will make a way where there seems to be no way he works in ways we cannot see he will make a way for me he will be my guide, hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. This is our testimony. Sing it again. Oh, God will make a way. Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way he will make a way with love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a What a song of testimony to these graduates today. God will make a way. And he has a way. He has a plan for your life. And I know that uh, it is a good plan. And I encourage you to always seek him, to follow him all the days of your life. Let me just say a word uh, to those who are joining us. And we're so thankful that you've joined us through Facebook Live. And others will watch later in the week. But starting next Sunday, it will be optional in wearing a mask in our worship time. And I appreciate you being faithful through all of this time and understanding. But we'll give you more information at the close of the service today. But starting next week, masks will be optional in our worship time. The title of my message today is, Let the Fire Fall. Jesus, we understand as we study the scriptures, is the fire from heaven. He often appeared as fire. He often spoke 
and reveal the power of God in fire in the Old Testament. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verses 1 through 3, we read these words. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. As we've been studying through the Old Testament and finding shadows of Christ, pictures of Christ throughout the Old Testament, you remember when we studied the book of Judges, and the book of Judges ends with these tell-all words. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does that sound like America? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The people began to ask Samuel, you'll remember after this, who was the last of the judges for a king to rule over them as the other nations around them had a king. You remember that it all began with Saul and, of course, David followed. God's intentions were that he would rule his people, that he would be their king. He would be the one that would guide them. But that's not what the people demanded. When Samuel was displeased with their demand, God reminded him that he was the one being rejected and not Samuel. You remember Samuel just got all down about it and, and went to the father and said, you know, I, I can't believe they're, they're rejecting my leadership as the judge. And God says, it's not you. They're rejecting my way of doing things. The books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles begin with the reign of Saul followed by David and went through all the time of the kings and concluded with the end of Israel's kings in their Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. Throughout the Old Testament, we find Jesus is manifest in fire. He is manifest by the coming of fire, the raining down of fire, the, the obvious visitation of God, such as Moses' confrontation with the burning bush after he had been on the backside of the desert. However you get on the backside of a desert, I don't know. But he had been on the backside of the desert, according to the Scripture. And after that time, God spoke to him in the burning bush, if you'll remember that. The Lord spoke to him from the fire of the burning bush. The bush was not consumed, according to Exodus 3.2, but God spoke to him in that fire. During their time of wandering in the wilderness, I'll remind you, Jesus showed up each night as a pillar of fire to protect them and to guide them at night, according to Numbers 14, 14. The books and kings, the books of Kings and Chronicles are laced full of these appearances of the Lord manifest as fire coming down from heaven. You'll remember in 1 Kings chapter 18 when there was the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal as whose God was real and whose God was able to meet their demands and their needs and to meet with the people. And so Elijah issued 
an invitation to the prophets of Baal. He said, I'll meet you on Mount Carmel. And he asked the, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, to all gather on Mount Carmel for that occasion. And he told the prophets of Baal, I'll tell you what you do. You build an altar to Baal, and I'll build an altar to, Jeho to Jehovah God. And we'll, we'll pray and ask our God to send down fire. And you remember, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll let you go first. And so they went first, they built their altar, and they placed the sacrifice on the altar, and they began to cry out to Baal to send down fire, and nothing happened. They began to, began to tear their clothing and to fall down on their faces and begging him to respond with fire, and nothing happened. They even cut themselves and presented themselves and cast themselves onto the altar thinking that Baal would respond and they were willing to sacrifice their own bodies that he would prove himself to be God and nothing happened. Elijah's making fun of them. He said, well, maybe he's on a journey right now and, and he can't hear you. Maybe you need to summon him a little louder so they begin to get louder and louder, and you can just see Elijah making full, uh, full of this uh, occasion, advantage of it. And then he says, you know, he, he, he may be asleep. You might need to wake him up. And they got louder even yet. And finally, when they had exhausted their energy and done all that they could, and there was obviously no fire from Baal, because why? There is no Baal. There is no God named Baal. And Elijah said, now you've had your time. And he sent for water to be put in barrels and come in to empty it three different times, I believe. They came and emptied those barrels of water on that altar. And he had a ditch dug around the altar and it even filled up the ditch with water. And Elijah said, so that the people may know that you are God. I ask you, send down the fire. And immediately, Jehovah God responded, and the fire fell on that altar, and it consumed the altar, consumed the sacrifice. It even, it says, licked up the water in the trench that had been dug and filled up with water, and God showed himself powerful in the presence of the coming of the fire. The Lord Jesus Christ, represented in that, has come and shows himself as King of kings, Lord of lords, and God of all gods, and he met their need. And what happened to the Israelite? They immediately fell on their knees, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And they worshiped him as he proved himself to be the God who is able. And then in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 26, you remember David had purchased the threshing floor on the summit of Mount Moriah, the very spot where the temple would be built by David's son Solomon at a later time when he became king. When David offered sacrifices to God on that summit as he built an altar, the Lord answered by sending down fire for the burnt offering and showed himself in approval and powerful, and there it is representative of the Lord Jesus Christ as a consuming fire. In Second Chronicles Chapter 7 and verse 1, decades after that very event on Mount Moriah, that very same spot as David's son Solomon dedicated the newly constructed Jewish temple, fire came down from heaven and consumed the offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and it was so powerful of his presence that not even the priests could go in to the temple, and they all fell back and worshiped and honored and gave glory to God as the one who is worthy of our worship 
and our praise as the glory of the Lord filled his temple. None of us, none of us were living during these days, even though some of these graduates think I was alive back then. But none of us were living during those days. That happened a long time ago. But every Christian needs to know that Jesus is an all-consuming fire. It is talked about in the Old Testament. It is demonstrated over and over again in the Old Testament. And then the New Testament talks about what he will do in the days ahead. Paul tells of a time when each of us will know him as the fire that he is, an all-consuming fire. He talks about the Christian will stand before him at the great, I mean, excuse me, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the lost will stand before God at the great white throne judgment that I almost said by mistake then. But the, the people of God, the Christians, those who have been saved, will stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll be judged for our works from the time that we've been saved. Those things that have been done for his glory, those things that have been done for our own vanity, those things that have been done that are pleasing to him, those things that have been done that are displeasing to him, all of those acts of obedience and following the lordship of Christ in our lives, and all of those acts of disobedience in not following the lordship of Christ and honoring him in our everyday life, will all be presented, everybody's life, every Christian's life, exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. There will be some embarrassed. Matter of fact, I think all will be embarrassed because every one of us have things in our lives that we would to God we had never been involved in or we'd never said or we'd never done. But we'll stand before him as everything is revealed now, will we not be judged for those things? We'll be judged according to the things that have been done for his glory. The judgment of our sin was satisfied on Calvary, for we bear it no more. When we are forgiven, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We are, are right with God. We are holy in him. And as we confess our sins, as John says in his first epistle, that if we confess our sins as Christians, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it will not be a judgment of our seed, of our deeds or our sins. It will be a judgment of our life as Christians. How did we serve him? How did we follow him? How did we do his perfect will? How attentive were we to the leadership of the Holy Spirit what things were done in the flesh, what things were done under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And it will be judged as the holy fire of God falls. And all of those things that were done by, in the flesh for our own glory, in our own will, in our own disobedience, will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble. It says there will be a lot of folks that everything they've ever done, they're Christians, but everything they've ever done in service, every day that they live, will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble, and they will lose all of those things except for themselves, it says. They will be saved. They will be spared. They are saved, the Scripture says, though as by fire. In other words, you've heard People say, well, I, I, I think I'm going to make it in by the skin of my teeth. That's exactly what he's talking about. They are saved. They are part of the family of God. They are born again. They are believers. They have trusted in the finished work of Jesus on the cross when the Holy Spirit of God dealt with their hearts and invited them to believe and come into faith in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been born again. But their life has not demonstrated a life of loving God. It's not been a life of service. It's not been a life of loving their fellow man. It's not been a life of commitment. It's not been a life of faithful obedience to the Lord's will in their lives. And they'll stand there 
And it says that they will be embarrassed at his appearing when he comes. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine knowing the one who died on the cross for your sins? Can you imagine knowing him personally and knowing that you have received him? He has forgiven you of every sin. He's given you a home in heaven. He's given you eternal life. He's given you a relationship with the Father. He's done all of that. Can you imagine being embarrassed when the one who loved you so, the one who was sacrificed for you, the one who gave you forgiveness and life, can you imagine being embarrassed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? But the scripture said there will be those who will be ashamed at his appearance. Why? Because there's been an unfruitful life since being saved. It has been an unfaithful life as as, as far as following Jesus day in and day out. And they will be embarrassed and they'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ when the fire of God presented in the Lord Jesus Christ himself consumes all of their works, destroys all that they have done, and they'll have nothing left but themselves to enter heaven. No recognition, no well done, thy good and faithful servant, no pat on the back from the Savior, no rejoicing over a life that's brought many into the kingdom of God, no one celebrating because this true and faithful servant led me to Christ or told me about Jesus, gave me testimony. This faithful one has taught me in Sunday school. There'll be those that that'll never be said of them and they'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, a consuming fire, and watch everything that they have lived for burn in the flames of the judgment of Jesus Christ himself. A burning fire. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13 through 15, the scripture says, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work and what sort it is, of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on, it endures he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but here it is, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I had an old preacher friend one time that says, some folks are going to go to heaven with a stench of fire smelling all over them. They're going to be there, but have nothing to show, a life of service. Jesus is a refining fire. He is a refining fire. If you let him have his way in your life, even though they're failures, even though we've all sinned, even though they're all mistakes in our lives, all of us have those mistakes, if you will let him have his way in your life, if you will be devoted to him, he will lead you in a way constructively. He'll lead you in a way for his glory and for your joy and for your peace. He will do a work in your life to prepare you for a life of service, that you'll be a blessing to others, that you'll be, your life will be a propagation of the gospel all on its own without you saying anything to anyone. If you'll just let God have his way in your life as the Lord Jesus Christ desires to burn out all of that chaff and all of that wood and stubble and all of the things that do not belong in a Christian's life, he's willing to take care of that right now in your life and to use you for his glory. Listen to what it says. He is a refining fire who will one day thank God, I said that, not him, burn away all our impurities. And when that is done, listen to what Jude says. 
And when all of that is done, he will present us faultless before the Father's throne. Faultless. We will stand as he presents us before the presence of his glory. Listen to what it says. With exceeding joy, according to Jude verse 24. He will present us faultless. Wow. We will stand before him for the judgment seat of Christ. But when we've come through that, we'll be presented to the Father as the bride of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the redeemed, the children of God. We'll be presented to the Father as faultless, without sin, without problem, without mistake, presented faultless before the Father. And he says he will do it with great joy. I'm talking about a Savior who has suffered for our sins. I'm talking about a Savior who went to the cross and died on the cross for you and for me. I'm talking about a Savior who came forth from the grave and conquered death, hell, and the grave for everyone who would believe in him. I'm talking about a Savior who was whipped and ridiculed and scorned and nailed to that cross and was in such horrible condition in his fleshly body But I'm talking about a Savior who went through all of that. He says he will present us faultless before the Father with great joy. You know what that means? Jesus is going to be happy over that day. All of his suffering was not in vain. All of his death experience and and robbing hell as he did and coming forth from the dead, all of that will not be in vain. And what a joy. I cannot imagine the Savior who has given us all that he's given us and and provided what he has provided for us, the Savior who has given us everlasting life, who guides us, who paid the price for our forgiveness and for our life, presenting us to the Father, and he's going to do it with, with great joy. I don't know if Jesus is going to holler. But how do you show your joy? Oh, listen, before the Father... Here is the, this is the one who heard the father say in an audible voice, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my son. Hear you him. And then this beloved son, our redeemer, our savior, the all-consuming fire that will judge us as his people will turn that into something of rejoicing and present us to the Father faultless. Anybody here faultless? Not a soul. Anybody here without sin? Not a soul. Anybody here who has not disappointed the Savior in your life? Not a soul. But all of those disappointments, all of those failures, all of those sins will be taken care of and he will remove them from our past, remove them from our present, he'll remove them from our lives and they'll be burned by the judgment fire of our Holy Savior and present us as though we never sinned, as though we were always faithful and he'll do it with great joy. Oh, my goodness. That ought to put you on shouting ground. I'm sorry, we're not Pentecostal, are we? But I am. I'm a little Baptocostal. I'm thankful that I, my sin has been paid for and that Jesus will present me faultless with exceeding Today, we have the same Jesus living in us. He guides us in what is his perfect will in each of our lives. Satan knows where we're vulnerable. He knows where we're apt to fail and to falter. 
He's apt to know what to do to cause us to stumble at our weakest moment. Oh, he's good at that kind of thing. But oh, listen, we won't have to put up with him for eternity. Aren't you thankful? He will be destroyed. He will be cast into the lake of fire. And we'll not know the temptation of the life that we now endure. Today, that same Jesus lives in us to guide us to live the life that he has perfectly planned for you. You graduates, God has a perfect plan, perfect plan for your life. He knows exactly what he wants you to do. You know, you're going to, you're going to go to school from here, all three of you, four of you, excuse me, have a perfect, God has a perfect plan for your future. But will you follow it? Will you fall susceptible to the one who'd have you to stumble and to fall and live a disappointing life, a disappointing life for the Savior? I want you to know you've met Jesus as your Savior, have you not? Thanks to the nod, you have. He lives in you. He's that all-consuming fire living in you. He is the glow that's in your heart. He is the joy that you experience. He is God's presence in your life. And he has a perfect plan for you. Seek that plan. Follow that plan. Trust him. One day, you'll be very, very glad you did. Jesus, Hebrew says, he is a consuming fire. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence with us this morning through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the indwelling Savior who loves us, who gave himself for us and guides us each day. And Lord, beginning in this pulpit, we will admit to you, we fail, we stumble, we fall, we make wrong decisions. We don't always please you. But Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your willingness to forgive us and to present us faultless before the Father. Lord, I pray for these graduates as they start out on a new journey now. I pray that you'll open up doors of opportunity. And Lord, I pray that you close doors of failure. Lord, I pray that you'll open up doors of exercising the gift of God that is within them. Lord, I pray you'll close up opportunities that would lead them in a direction that would not please you. Give them discernment beyond their experience. Lord, give them wisdom beyond their days and give them your indwelling Holy Spirit to guide them, bless them, and direct them all the days of their lives. I thank you for these four young folks. I love them. I thank you for their commitment to you. I thank you for their love for me and the many wonderful times that we've enjoyed together. And I look forward to the years ahead, as long as you give me, that I'll hear raving reports on what you've done in their lives and through their lives. Bless them as only you can. And may the rest of us pay attention to what you're saying to us. May we seek to serve you, to be faithful, to be true, and to know that we need to remember that we will give an account of the things we've done, whether in your Holy Spirit's leadership or in our own flesh. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to know that you are our life, 
our future, and our hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.